Yes, Mr. Chairman. May it please your Lordship and your Ladyships. Um, to uh, just picking up a few loose ends before I continue with the legal propositions. Uh, yesterday I made one submission on a false assumption. I invited you to infer abandonment of the cargo by the Republic of South Africa. Uh, th there's no need to infer it. At paragraph 10 of the, their additional skeleton argument, that's supplemental bundle 2, divide 10, page 150, the Republic affirmatively states that by reason of the decision of the master and the crew to abandon the ship and cargo, the Republic has abandoned the cargo. Uh, in those circumstances, it's unclear as to why uh, we have to approve uh, uh, abandonment uh, where counsel for the Republic has put it in writing that the Republic has abandoned the cargo. Well, that's all very forensic, but that's something which, which is a taken place long after the cause of action in salvage arose uh, and uh, the cargo was treated as wrecked by the receiver. So I don't think that um, relieves you of the burden of identifying why on your case the cargo had become wrecked uh, before or at the time that it was landed in Southampton. And your case is that in Tell me if I'm wrong, I'm just seeing if I've understood it. Yes. I understand your case to be that so far as cargo is concerned, it becomes wreck as derelict, can be can, can be wreck in other ways, but as derelict, it becomes wreck by virtue of the intention of the cargo owners as to its abandonment, <coughs> and that in this case, the circumstances are such that it is to be inferred that uh, the Republic government of the Union, as it then was, made a decision to abandon the silver in this case. Have I understood, have I understood you, correctly? You have understood it correctly, just in the same way as the master and the crew recognised that there was no hope of recovery. So at the time, effectively, the Republic did the same. When, when, it, when, it, when, it, when vessel and cargo went to the bottom of the sea, or at least shortly thereafter, um, <coughs> the owners uh, had the relevant intention to make the vessel wreck, and the Republic had the relevant intention to make the silver wreck. Thank you. Um, then just dealing with a, a matter raised by my lady, uh, Lady Justice Elizabeth Lang, um, in relation was the day one, um, it's in the transcript page 33, 8 to 11, um, in the context of the Merchant Shipping Act, uh, and the question of the assumption uh, in the case of unclaimed wreck that there isn't a dispute, uh, which arguably justifies, explains why the receiver deciding on salvage in that context is different. In our submission, that's not an assumption which can be made. There could still be a dispute about whether salvage is due and the quantum of it. See the facts of the Knight case, to which we referred, where the receiver said the salvor had lost its entitlement to salvage due to its failure to declare the canon to the receiver timelessly. And that decision was taken on judicial review and considered in the case of the Knight. So even in the case of unclaimed wreck, there may well be disputes. Uh, then um, my lady, Lady Justice Elizabeth Lang, also raised a question about the Senior Courts Act 1981 and the caveat uh, at, uh, at section 20, subsection 7. Uh, and in, in that regard, if I may, I'll just hand up uh, all that we've been able to find that might be of use uh, is a section in Kennedy and Rose uh, on the law of salvage. Sorry, I meant to say yesterday, Thank you. but it's too late. Um, Single-sided photocopying for me. I do apologise. Don't worry, it's a small bit. It's a small bit. I, I, 
only mention it in case there's going to be anything else during the course of the <laughs> <or> hereafter. <laughs> I understand that. Certainly, um, um, what, what I'm going to hand up is, is not on the <coughs> side of the <coughs> uh, The relevant section is at paragraph 4149, uh, and the paragraph with a line alongside it, uh, the Senior Courts Act 1981 declares the High Court to have admiralty jurisdiction over any claims <coughs> in the nature of salvage in relation to all ships or aircraft, whether British or not, and in relation to all claims wherever arising, and references there made uh, to uh, section 20J 6 and 7. But the Act does not extend the cases in which salvage is recoverable under the Merchant Shipping Act. And that's three seven, footnote 377 seven, and a direct reference to the proviso. I was going to. <coughs> Then continue, if I may, uh, with a consideration <coughs> of the propositions of law, uh, and uh, I in order to um, <coughs> assist the court, uh, I've reduced those to writing. I've shared them with my learned friends, just so that it means that I can take them uh, more quickly than requiring <coughs> all to have to um, write them out in appendix. Very much. Um, uh, Mr. Um, my learned friend, Mr. Smith, has uh, commented on these, uh, and uh, perhaps I should take those right away so that you can make the I can make the corrections in order to reflect his position as well, where I have inadvertently um, misunderstood his. And so um, I, I got as far as Proposition 5. I was going to move on to Proposition 6. Uh, but in relation to Proposition 7, um, where I say in the last sentence would appear to be common ground, uh, that is incorrect. It's not common ground. Uh, then in relation to Paragraph 14, um, uh, my learned friend again has kindly pointed out that the reference in the first line should be to section 10.4a uh, and that leads me and this is a correction that I needed to make consequent on that uh, and my learned friend hasn't yet had a chance to comment on it is that I would want to add the words Section 10.4a applies solely to voluntary salvage and contractual salvage insofar as Brussels Convention states are concerned. And then um, Proposition 16, in the final sentence, <coughs> It is not common ground as regards, quote, property, close quote. Uh, and in 17, a similar change, uh, you would need to add, and would appear to be common ground, save as regards, quote, property, close quote. Then uh, Proposition 19, um, one needs to add a qualification, comma, subject to the fact that the Republic, say, state-owned property not in use or not intended for is sovereign. 
so it's in that sense that there is no third category. So there's agreement that there is a dichotomy and no third category. The difference between myself and Mr. Smith is he, he says that property not in use or not intended for use is sovereign. Or, or what that does, of course, is to raise the meaning of the word in use uh, in the context of uh, a particular voyage, and I'll come to those submissions. And then finally, Proposition 20. Um, uh, again, uh, this uh, I suggested it appeared to be common ground. It's not. This is not common ground. Uh, there are no <coughs> corrections that need to be made to the Human Rights Act section, beginning on page. So I'm, I'm immensely grateful to my little friend for uh, indicating that to me. <coughs> my, my Lord, my ladies, it goes very slightly further than that. Not only are there no corrections to the HRA section, we, we agree with it. We, and so it perhaps needs to be corrected to say this is all common ground. Uh, I think the thanks are due to my learned junior. I'm very grateful. <coughs> so my lord and my ladies I was at uh, proposition 6 uh, and it's there set out customary international law adopts the restrictive doctrine of state immunity pursuant to which there is a dichotomy between acts pure and peri and acts pure gestiones and a state is only entitled to immunity insofar as acts pure imperi are concerned. Uh, this dichotomy has certain corollaries that we spell out in paragraph 41 of our additional <coughs> argument. Uh, and this is at ground one uh, of the respondent's notice. Uh, and this common ground. Proposition 7 which is not common ground, uh, the distinction between acts jure imperii and acts jure gestionis is a question of the nature <coughs> or character of the act rather than the state's motive or purpose in engaging in the activity in question. Uh, and this is a distinction of, of the utmost importance. Uh, this is ground two of the respondent's notice. Uh, this is, I'm told, not common ground, uh, but that language is taken expressly uh, from the language used uh, by Lord Wilberforce in uh, Premier Congresso uh, and also in the Alcon, from recollection, but I, I'll, I'll get my juniors to, to follow up that um, uh, in a moment. surprised by the suggestion that that isn't based on the authorities at the highest level but I, at least I'll, I'll, get, I'll refer you specifically to the passages. Proposition 8, the purpose of the State Immunity Act was to bring English law in line with customary international law. Uh, proposition 9, when construing... Sorry, what, what's the authority for that? Um... Enkar Bush, uh, Lord Sumption, uh, and also um, um, when the statute was uh, introduced into Parliament, it was made clear that that was its purpose. Sorry, Benkar Bush, paragraph. Sure, that's 
Right. Um, in um, Congresso del Partido, is it not said that English law might, might um, take, take a different view? In, in its domestic law as to what it wanted to enact. I misremembered that. Uh, well, again, I, I, I'll get my genius to, to follow up the authorities. I'm afraid I don't have them because I understood the common ground, but I will get the... So what was the act preceded by you know, a law commission report, a white paper, a green paper? Those sorts of materials are admissible. I'm not no. sure that hands are admissible for that purpose. Uh, the answer is no to your ladyship's question. Yes. Um, my recollection, Professor Paul Wilmot said, we, 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 don't, we mustn't look at the 78 Act, which is, doesn't doesn't actually apply because it's not to be assumed that uh, what was put into domestic law is uh, in any respect uh, a, a guide to what customary international law. Uh, but I may have misremembered. Page 192 at uh, B. Lord Wilberforce. Sorry, can you remember, remind me which tab that is? Yes, I'm sure. Which? It's page. Uh, it's Tab nine of the first, of the first <coughs> authorities plan of all the Is the passage I think my Lord had in mind? Superseded by the adoption of the restrictive doctrine of state immunity at common law. The Act therefore dealt more broadly with state immunity by providing in Section 1 for a state to be immune from the jurisdiction of the courts of the United Kingdom, except as provided in the following sections of Part 1. Exceptions relate to a broad range of acts conceived to be of a private law character, including widely defined categories of commercial transactions and commercial activities, as well as conflicts of employment and enforcement in the state owned property used or intended for. One of the reasons I just paused uh, at, at your formulation in Proposition 8 is that it, it, it's also common ground, as Lord Sumption says here, and as is apparent from 10.6, that the purpose was to give effect to the 1926 Brussels Convention. Yes. Uh, and um, one would not have assumed that uh, the 1926 Convention necessarily represented customary international law in 1978, mm. in, in which case it's, we can't be doing both. It, it, with respect, it can. But isn't that the point that Lord Sumption's making in um, the third sentence of paragraph 10? Because he's saying, 
by this time the collection is largely being superseded by the adoption of the restrictive doctrine. He's not seeking to suggest at all that there might be a difference between um, the, the, the State Immunity Act compliance with the Brussels Convention and the adoption of the restrictive uh, theory, the doctrine of state immunity. A and indeed, insofar as the statute doesn't reflect the restrictive theory of state immunity, uh, then we're straight into the uh, Human Rights Act. about the Act in general. Yes. Uh, for Section 10 purposes, we're absolutely looking at the Brussels Convention, yes. um, more, more particularly, as it were. Um, uh, and I think you both say we should construe what's meant by Section 10 by reference to the fact that it's intended to give effect to Articles 1 to 3 of the Brussels Convention. And the restrictive theory of Custom International, because by that stage, as will be Assumption says by 1979, when the statute was passed, the conventions had been superseded, largely superseded by the adoption of the restrictive doctrine of state immunity at common law. Um, which, um, whilst that is still open, when construing uh, Proposition 9, when construing uh, the uh, State Immunity Act, paragraph 10 of Ben Consumption deals with this, uh, one must do so against the background of the principles of public international law, including the dichotomy between purely sovereign acts and all other acts, <coughs> acts of a private or commercial character, uh, and uh, the passage uh, which um, uh, is quoted from Alton, Lord Diplock's at 597G 598A uh, is there set out and that is uh, the uh, first uh, authority that we were seeking to rely upon for that proposition and I won't take you independently to Alton, just it's set out there in paragraph 10 of, of Benko. And um, sorry, you lost me slightly. You're on Proposition Nine or Ten? I'm now know. on Proposition Nine. Yes. Uh, and what, what, is, what is set out there? Or when construing the it was Lord Diplock in Alcom that was the yes, authority sorry. for that. Let me tell you, at the bottom of paragraph ten on page three nine, six nine of Benkom, which is quoted. But but let's look at it in Alcom. Um, if that would assist. Alcom is uh, in the well, I, don't, I, I, I don't mind if you just give us the references for these as, oh, I'm so sorry. as we go through and we, we can chase them. But it's your authority for Proposition 9 is Lord Diplock in Alcom at. At, at Authorities Bundle 10. Yes, but at what page? Of pages two, two, 229 to 230. Is that the report? That's the. Uh, no, the pages in the bundle. Uh, can I have the report? It's 597G. I'm sorry to be difficult, but no, no. I, I looked at a number of these cases and marked them up before I had an authorities bundle. Uh, of course, and I, therefore, I'm, I'm working off page or paragraph numbers in the judgments themselves. I, I will endeavour to give both references. It's 597G to 598A. Thank you. But is the entire passage quoted in Lord Sumption's judgments uh, in Bankabush? I think it is. So it's easy. If it is, then it's just easier to look Well, I, I, if for present purposes that is sufficient, yes. Okay. Thank you. A and uh, the same point uh, it was made by the Court of Appeal in the to take a prestige numbers three and four, authorities bundle twenty, page four seven zero to four seven one, uh, and that is paragraphs thirty nine and forty uh, of the judgment of the court, which re uh, there they repeat that the.
State Immunity Act must be interpreted in a manner which is consistent <coughs> with customary international law. Uh, proposition 10, uh, one purpose of the S State Immunity Act was to give effect to the Brussels Convention. I've taken you to paragraph 10 of Benka uh, and uh, properly construed the Brussels Convention supports the Salvo's case uh, we, we submitted. Uh, it does not contemplate that the Republic would be immune from a claim of this kind. Uh, and I was going to go at this point uh, to the Convention, if yeah. I may, uh, and that is in uh, Authorities Bundle 2, Divide 50. regards um, claims relating to the operation of su such ships or in respect of the carriage of such cargoes, they, it states, shall be subject to the same rules of liability and the same obligations as those applicable in the case of privately owned ships, This includes the obligation for present purposes to pay salvage. Uh, then moving on to Article 2, for the enforcement of such liabilities and obligations there should be the same rules concerning the jurisdiction of tribunals, the same legal actions and the same procedure as in the case of the privately owned merchant vessels and cargoes of their owners. Uh, so this provision effectively affirms that the domestic rule, quote, concerning the jurisdiction of tribunals, close quotes, applies in the case of a claim within the ambit of Article 1. Put another way, <coughs> the state is not immune with respect to such claims. This, it might be added, is consistent with the uh, restrictive immunity theory. The state is immune only with respect to sovereign acts, which we come in the next article. Uh, and it might well, also be added... So far, we've, we've just got a blanket with um, withdrawal of immunity, immunity, as it were. And we have to look to Article 3 to see the extent to which immunity is either conferred or preserved, depending on how you look at it. Is that right? It, that is right, although it's of importance that Article 2 does not draw a distinction between in persona mini and in rem claims. Both are captured in the wording of the provision. The, the provision also affirms that the same domestic legal actions and the same domestic pr procedures apply in the case of a claim within the end of Article 1. And then uh, on to Article 3, <coughs> see the immunity is reintroduced by reference to sovereign acts. And again, in a manner consistent with the restrictive theory of immunity, three paragraphs. Paragraph 1 
reintroduces immunity for ships in use for governmental, non-governmental purposes such as warships. So just pausing there, my reference to Article 3.1, it's common ground that the vessel in this case does not fall into this category, not owned by the Republic, it was a privately owned trading ship. And then immediately below, we see certain exceptions to this immunity get introduced. It was, it, was, it was in fact owned by a state at the time the cause of action for salvage arose, wasn't it? The UK government. It, it was owned yeah. by a state as the insurer. Well, uh, you say as, as an insurer, it was owned by the UK <coughs> government. <coughs> It, it, anyway, it was, it was, again, we're getting all the time. We're getting. We're, we're looking at it only at the at the bottom of the sea in 2017, and our submissions will be that you've got to look at the position in 1942, and therefore it was not state owned at that time. It may have become state owned when a subrogated insurer became the owner subsequently, and it's for that reason that I. I well, I understand your submission on the on the act and so on. I'm just looking at the wording in, in Article Three, owned or operated by a state, uh, and used at the time a cause of action arises. It looks as though it's looking quite unequivocally at whether it's owned or operated by the state at the time the cause of action arises, doesn't it? Well, I suppose it could be said that the, 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 the and establishes two conditions, one, who owns it, and two, what's happening, how, it, how it's being used at the date when the cause of action arises. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not sure that's the point of, no, no, of, of, yeah, a point of great significance. It, um, it, the mere fact that it changes ownership doesn't mean that it changes use. Um, but, but again, we can come... Again, no, I, I understand, and, and <clears throat> that begs the question as to whether you're looking at change, and that, that's... That, that, that's that, that's where there's a distinction between rights. Sorry, I, I, I perhaps sh shouldn't have um, no. introduced that. No, no, it's very helpful indeed. I'm, I'm most grateful. Uh, then immediately below, we see certain exceptions to this immunity get introduced. Yes. So there's no immunity. Then there's some immunity, and now there's some exceptions to that immunity. Yes. Uh, but only before the courts of the state that owns and operates. The Nevertheless, claimants shall have the right of taking proceedings in the competent tribunals of the state owning or operating the vessel without the, that state being permitted to avail itself of its immunity. Uh -huh. And then three classes of non immune proceedings are set out. So, the short point if you salvage a warship, the state that owns the warship is immune from any claim for salvage, save before its own courts. Article 3, paragraph 2, extends the immunity. Can I, <coughs> can I pause on paragraph 1 and just yes, see whether, and if so, how you say the draftsman drafter of the 1978 Act carried that into effect in Section 10. Because it doesn't look, does it, as though in Section 10.2 and 10.3 the uh, drafter of the Act carved out as uh, not being the subject of, of immunity all cases of actions for collision, uh, assistance, salvage, general average, Repairs, supplies, other contracts relating to the vessel. No, we don't. We don't see any of that in ten two. No. So, you, as I understand it, you say that the way this is to be construed is it's not it's not drawing a distinction between in personam and in rem, and, and obviously this is significant when we get to, to to paragraph three. But just for the moment, dealing with paragraph one, those you say. 
that there's no distinction between proceedings in rem and in personam here, that that is carving out from immunity all those kinds of actions against a state ship owner. And uh, by virtue of paragraph two, um, state-owned cargo is on board such vessels. That can't have been how the drafter of the of section 10 saw it, can it? If the drafter was intending to give effect to that paragraph. Th that, that would seem to be logically correct, yes. Um, yes. Right, thank you. Then we get to paragraph 3, which is the one that's directly relevant, yes? Correct. Can I, can I just ask a sort of follow up question? Um, we see which states signed up to the convention on the first page. Yes. Um, can one assume that the domestic law of all those states ma made at that stage a distinction between actions in rem and actions in persona? No. One presumably can't. No. So it may be that that distinction is either unique to our system or at any rate not shared widely. Well, you get that in the, uh, actually, if you look at the Travo, because the it was either the French or the Spanish delegates um, at the time when one of the conventions was coming in were saying there's no such thing as an action in REM in France. Yeah. But so I suppose the point is you wouldn't necessarily expect the convention to make that distinction if it's not a distinction that's it's a common widely thing. common. The, the Trevo well, is Trevo to the Salvage Convention, yeah. not the, this yes. convention. And so that's the first point to, to note. But in answer to uh, my lady's question, um, and I don't think I'm giving evidence, I can, I can find uh, documents which support this, that uh, within common law jurisdictions and within the United States of America, for example, there are actions in REM, mm -hmm. uh, and, but within uh, civil law countries, uh, on the whole, uh, there are not, although there, yeah. again, there are exceptions even to that. Okay. So not every country has an action in so I just want to get a general picture. I don't know. But, but, but many, many do. Um, because, yeah. of course, <laughs> the 1894 Act, um, I'm going to be politically incorrect now, but the 1894 Act applied to the Empire. Um, yeah. It applied um, to the, the Dominions, etc., etc. Well, that's not politically incorrect, it's historically accurate. <laughs> All right. Um, well, please, yes, I should perhaps try and describe it. But, but clearly, the. the, the the signatories to this convention, uh, one can see from the way it's drafted, ha had in mind the distinction between proceedings in rem because in, and in personam because uh, that's what's dealt with in the, in the first part of para one and the first part of para three uh, as prima facie subject to whatever is carved back out of it, what is going to be preserved or retained by way of immunity. Yes. And it's, it's, it's uh, looking at the property subject to seizure attachment or detention by legal process or judicial proceedings in REM, yes. which won't apply to proceedings in persona. No. Then into the all-important Article uh, 3, uh, Paragraph 3, state-owned cargo is carried on board merchant vessels for governmental and non-governmental purposes shall not be subject to seizure by any legal process, nor to judicial proceedings in REM. So, so, so what this provision does, uh, like Article 3 of Paragraphs 1 and 2, uh, is to reintroduce an immunity It is from enforcement jurisdiction, seizure, attachment, or detention, uh, and from in rem proceedings generally. It is limited to 
using the language of Mr. Justice Gross in Yaltair, non-commercial conduct. And that raises the whole question which I'm going to have to address in future. What is the status of the cargo on board a vessel? That's an exception to the rule set out in Article 2. But the second part of Article 3, Paragraph 3, contains an exception to this exception. It removes the immunity just reintroduced with respect to certain classes of claim, including salvage. Nevertheless, actions in respect of collision accidents and navigation assistance and salvage and general average and actions on a contract relating to such cargo may be brought before the tribunal having jurisdiction under Article 2. Thus, if a tribunal under Article 2 has jurisdiction in respect of a salvage claim in respect of a private cargo under its own rules, Article 3, Paragraph 3, confirms that the state is not immune from a corresponding claim even if the cargo is carried for sovereign purposes. And not immune whether it's in personam or in rem? Correct. As I understand it, you say that the effect of the second paragraph is to carve out from immunity any of those kinds of claim. Correct. So we're not just salvage, but collisions, assistance, general average, actions on a contract relating to the cargo. And one can see the public policy behind that. Do you say that the drafter of the 1978 Act in Section 10.4 understood it in that way? Because I have great difficulty in seeing how he or she could have done. That's exactly where I'm going to next, to address that question. All right. But before I do that, the first point to make is that a distinction is drawn between a commercial cargo and a non-commercial cargo, or using the language of the Convention, carried on board vessels for governmental and non-commercial purposes, and those which are otherwise carried. So there is a distinction drawn between the two, and that distinction has consequences. It was intended to have consequences, and one needs to bear in mind the time at which the Convention was agreed as to what the draftsman might have had in mind in relation to that distinction. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean by that. What was it about the situation at that time that helps us? Well, the example, the only example which has been postulated as to how a cargo, on my learned friend's approach to use of cargo, the only way in which a cargo could be used for the purposes, the cargo as such, would be an LNG cargo where permission was given to burn off the vapour in order to drive the vessel. That clearly was not in mind when the draftsman drafted this Convention. And so it educates, we say, when you come to work out what the distinction is in use or intended for use for commercial purposes, it educates that process of construction. Then moving on to the answer to my Lord's question, why is there an additional requirement on cargo in Section 10.4a? 
It is that Section 10.4a is designed to ensure that Article 3.3, first paragraph, is complied with, and Section 10.4b is there to ensure that Article 3.3, second paragraph, is complied with. You're going to come on to this. I don't understand how 10.4a can be consistent with your construction, because I think you say that the carve-out in the final paragraph applies as much to proceedings in rem as it does to proceedings in personam. So it doesn't matter what the purpose is, commercial sovereign or use or intended use, commercial or sovereign is, of the cargo owner in cases of collision, salvage, general average actions on a contract. That's not what 10.4a says. Well, it's seeking to draw the distinction between those cases in which the cargo is in use for commercial purposes and those cases in which the cargo is not in use. I understand that submission, but I'm just at the moment on your construction of how these two paragraphs fit together. What's said against you is the final paragraph is only dealing with in personam. Your construction is, no, it carves out of immunity in proceedings in rem as well as in personam those particular types of claims, all on the hypothesis that this is a commercial rather than sovereign use of the cargo. But 10.4a, even in cases of sovereign use of the cargo, doesn't carve out all those particular actions. So the drafter can't have been giving effect to the paragraph 3.3 if it means what you say it means. Well, it does. Sorry. I mean, that's the point I'm still struggling with. I don't know if I'm articulating it. It does in relation to salvage, and 10.4a is only dealing with salvage. Well, what about these other kinds of cause of action? I don't know. Whether those were given effect to or not is irrelevant for present purposes. For present purposes, we're concentrating on salvage. We know that 10.4 relates to salvage. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We've got to construe the act. If you're saying that the act understood the convention to mean what you say it means, we can't just look at salvage, can we? No. I accept that you can't just look at salvage. Right. But the question that I'm being asked to consider is, what's the genesis of 10.4a and 10.4b, and why are they there? And I'm seeking to explain that in the context of the Brussels Convention, and I'm giving a justification for those based upon the Brussels Convention. So Section 10 deals with similar questions, but I must say, like what I've just said, it doesn't seem to me that Section 10 deals with those questions in the way that Article 3 does. Well, that may... And is that your submission? Or are you submitting that Section 10 does deal with those issues in the way that Article 3 does? We say that it does, but if we're wrong and it doesn't, then the court's task is to construe it having regard to the convention, so to come to the same conclusion. So we say it's a matter of construction. Well, no, wait a minute. We can have the convention in the background, but we can't... If the words of Section 10 mean something completely different from Article 3, we can't use Article 3 as a way of turning the words of Section 10 into something else, can we? You can't... You can't... 
primarily need to have regard to ensuring that the restrictive theory uh, is um, complied with. A and we know as part of the history uh, that this <coughs> act uh, was designed at least in part to enable this country to comply with its convention obligations. A and therefore, to that extent, one can have regard to it uh, in construing the state immunity. I, mean, I, I, I can understand your submission that what, what we get out of paragraph three um, it is that the expression uh, merchant vessels is used, which the drafter of the 78 Act uh, might be trying to express by the slightly different language in the Act of use or intended use of the ship. And I can un also understand uh, that the, the, the one can do the same reading across, as it were, from governmental and non-commercial purposes to, in relation to the cargo, use or intended use for commercial purposes. I, I understand that, and that's not dependent on the fact that that um, uh, the, the 78 Act may not have reproduced what's, what's got to happen for all these particular types of claims. But um, I, I, speaking for myself, I, I do find the suggestion that at least the draft of the 1978 Act saw the carve-out in the final paragraph as applying to impersonal proceedings uh, uh, rather more persuasive because... Um, that's, that's, that's what's happened in 10B anyway. But, 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 but even if that is right, that, that, that is, that, that, that in a sense doesn't defeat our case at all. No, I'm not suggesting it does. I'm, I, what I am doing is suggesting that, it, it, that your interpretation of the convention yes. uh, is less likely to be the one that the drafter of the 1978 Act took than that which is advanced on behalf of the government. That's, that's, that's the point I'm putting to you. Well, I understand that, and I understand um, that, that, that submission. I've made my submissions as to why we say the contrary, but yeah. I understand that, but I say that doesn't matter. I, am, I, also, I also understand that. If I can say, go further, if the intention was to exclude all state-owned cargo in 10.4a, then, as my lady, lady Justice Andrews pointed out, you would not have needed any reference to the ship in section 10.4a at all. A and the result would not be in line with uh, the restrictive theory. In England, <coughs> when they bring an action in personam or an action in rem, and there is no reason why an action in REM should not be brought for salvage of commercial cargo. But your basic point on Article 3.3 3 is that it's essentially saying that a state is not immune in relation to a state-owned cargo um, in respect of actions, um, but for salvage actions. Isn't that what you're saying? I, I am. Yeah. And I'm saying that the convention goes wider than the State Immunity Act does, because you would expect a provision to be made whereby there was no immunity in respect of salvage full stop, whether it was a state-owned cargo or not a state-owned cargo. Sorry, whether it was a cargo for use for sovereign purposes. Well, that does depend on your construction of the, of the convention, doesn't it? If, if what the convention means is you, you retain in rem immunity if it is a sovereign purpose for salvage, but you don't for impersonant claims, that is reflected in 10.4 A and B. Because ten four B doesn't doesn't address sovereign purposes in relation to the cargo, so 
for all salvage claims in personam, the immunity is removed, subject, of course, to what, what use of the vessel means and so on. But looking at it just from the cargo, yes. but for 10.4a in REM, the immunity is retained for salvage, provided, of course, that it, it comes within the for governmental and non-commercial purposes, yes. which is what the draftsman has translated <coughs> into the cargo being in use or intended use for commercial purposes. Yes. So, well, I, I'm, I'm putting the same point to you again, but there we are. two and three, but there's one point I need to make, come back on in relation to Article 2. Um, uh, and it's, it's my fault, I'm sure, but I'm not sure whether it's being argued still or not, but it was argued below by uh, the Republic that Article 2 is limited to in persona claims, and therefore that as a state is immune from claims in rem, not just proceedings for seizure, attachment, or detention, insofar as the claims concern a state-owned cargoes carried on board merchant vessels for government and non-commercial purposes. Uh, I've already explained why there's no uh, reason for reading Article 2 in that way. Uh, and further, uh, if um, authority were required, um, uh, as pointed out by the judge at paragraph 134 in, in the judgment uh, in the uh, Philippine Admiral, uh, Admiral internal page 395B to C uh, in the authorities bundle divide 6, page 100B to C. Lord Cross stated, it, it will be observed that that article, that's Article 1 of the Brussels Convention, covers not only actions in REM but also actions in persona. Article 2 refers to, and I quote from his sp uh, speech, <coughs> the, sorry, judgment of the Privy Council, the enforcement advice, from his advice, for the enforcement of such liabilities, so by what, which he meant liabilities referred to at Article 1, so there is no reason to think that Article 2 is limited to in personam claims for that reason uh, as well. And, and, and you can further say uh, whether, whether or not that's what the Convention means, that's certainly what the draft of the 1978 Act thought it meant in framing Section 10.4a because he or she did envisage that immunity could be lost for in rem proceedings. Before I leave the convention, there's no distinction <coughs> in the convention between salvage of wreck and salvage of non-wreck. Uh, rules of immunity apply equally to both. There's no suggestion that the rules regarding immunity change uh, in a trice when a ship or cargo comes aboard. Proposition 11. The Act sets out a blanket rule of immunity subject to exceptions. Uh, Proposition 12, an unquestioning restrictive interpretation of the exceptions to the presumptive immunity, that's section 1 of the Act, would not be in accordance with the spirit of the restrictive doctrine which the Act was meant to reflect. And in that regard, um, in, in uh, Benkar Bush, uh, paragraphs 38 to 39, Lord Sumption describes the rule exception structure of the Act as a mere drafting technique. Uh, and that point is also uh, made by many of the textbook writers. Um, we've put in Dickinson, Bird, uh, and Higgins at divides 19, 23, and 26. Uh, I wasn't going to take you to those uh, now.
Now, Dickinson, paragraph 4, stop 15, uh, Bird at page 626, uh, and Professor Higgins Proposition 13, a primary set of exceptions, including the one we are concerned with, is the commercial transaction or the commercial purposes set of exceptions, sections 3, 10, and 13. Now, just by way of commentary, and I, again, I'll expand on this later, although I see I'm running, I've got to get a move on. Uh, this set of exceptions applies to the court's adjudic adjudicative and enforcement jurisdiction and is defined by reference to whether the dispute relates to or is concerned with a commercial dis transaction as defined in section 3.3 uh, or an asset which is in use or intended for use for commercial purposes. When you say these sections apply to adjudicative and enforcement, Immunity. Yeah, uh, three and three and ten, and ten are adjudicative, and thirteen is enforcement. Right. Right. Uh, and uh, w when one comes to section ten, uh, w one has to have regard. Section seventeen requires one to to have regard to section three, and, and I'll come to that in a moment. Because section three uh, is the paragraph which sets out what commercial transactions are. So section 3.1 is, is an adjudicative provision and provides that a state is not immune in respect of proceedings relating to a commercial transaction entered into by the state. And section 3.3 provides a special definition for commercial transaction. Section 13.4, which is the enforcement provision, states that the Act does not prevent the issue of any process in respect of property that is in use or intended for use for commercial purposes. And Section 17.1 tells us that commercial purposes means purposes of such transactions or activities as are mentioned in Section 3.3. Does the dichotomy between in-use and intended use of property, whether we're looking at it in Section 10 or Section 13, mean that the drafter imagined that you could have property which was not in use, in which case what would matter would be intended use. And if not, why, why, why does intended use come into it at all? Um, th because um, so, so long as one can, the drafts, the drafter clearly required. Um, well, let me get the section in front of me before I. My, my, my lord, I, I should say I, these are points I'm going to. All right, all right, do, do take them in your I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm slowing you down. I'll, no, no, no. You, 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 you continue your submissions and I'll, I'll, I'll come back at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Well, no, 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 not necessarily at the end. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I do address it in a context and there's, much, there's quite a lot that needs to be said. Right. And so I'll do that later if I may. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, the court's adjudicative jurisdiction in connection with admiralty matters is dealt with section 10. Section 10 for a provides, as we've seen, as a result of the definition of section 17, commercial purposes, means purposes of such transactions or activities as are mentioned in section 3.3. We'll look at that later. Proposition 14, uh, section 10 for a applies materially to salvage only. This is common ground. Uh, and as contractual salvage comes within section 3, section 10 for a applies solely to voluntary salvage and contractual salvage insofar as the Brussels Conventions states are concerned. So, so 
I mean, the important bit is it does apply to some contractual salvage. It's not, a, not only concerned with voluntary salvage. C correct. And that is very important when one comes to see the definition of commercial transactions in Section 3. Because uh, one needs to be reading Section 10 that for the salvage, the, the, the Brussels um, Convention states in a way which is consistent with it, uh, section 3, which applies to non-convention states. Um, proposition 15, the phrase commercial transaction as defined in the Act is very broad. Uh, I'll just note two aspects at the moment. First, 3A and 3B refer to any contracts for the supply of goods or services and any loan or other transaction for the provision of finance. It's irrelevant whether those acts were entered into in the exercise of sovereign authority or not. The s second is sweep the sweep up at section 33C is wide enough to cover in any non sovereign activity of a state. A a and um, support for that proposition we've already looked at in. Kuwait Airways uh, in the speech of Lord Goff, Authorities Bundle 11 at page 251 in the original page 1159 at letter H. And to that's clear. So the sweep up is wide enough to cover any non sovereign activity of the state, and this reflects the intention of the restrictive of immunity, only acts of a wholly sovereign character, jure imperium, are immune. Proposition 16, therefore, uh, 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 as is the position under customary international law, section, in section 33C and hence 10.4a, a comprehensive dichotomy is set up between commercial transactions on the one hand and sovereign acts, that is, using the language of 3.3c, activity in which the state engages otherwise than in the exercise of sovereign authority, on the other hand. There is no third or intermediate category. Now, Mr. Smith yesterday shook his head when I said that the restrictive theory conceives of two categories of act, one sovereign, one non-sovereign, and that in the absence of a sovereign act, state conduct was presumptively non-sovereign, there is no third category of non-use which is presumptively sovereign. I, I made that point yesterday by reference to Lord Wilberforce in Premier Congresso, uh, and in a moment when I uh, come to look in detail at Section 3, uh, I'll make it good by reference to the State Immunity Act as well. Uh, and as authority for this proposition, um, Lord Sumption, paragraphs 38 to 39 in Benkart Bush, the reference to drafting technique. Authorities bundle 34 at page 753. Lewis, the case of the sugar, the Cuban sugar at page 97. Uh, one paragraph, one passage that I need to take you to is because my little friend referred to it, but in our submission, uh, out of context, <laughs> uh, and that is Fox and Webb, the, uh, the authorities bundle divide 31, pages 700 This is the Law of State Immunity, um, revised and updated third edition, uh, and uh, I was wanting to take you to a passage on page 721 to 722, uh, where the... Sorry, internal page number? The internal page number 196 and 197. The editors at 
dealing with the general structure of section 3, uh, and at the bottom of the first page highlighted section, uh, says there's six points may be made about the final limit of the statute definition of commercial transaction contained in subsection 3, although not expressly stated, the nature and not the purpose of the transaction or activity determines whether or not it is immune. That's a point I made earlier. The test first judicially set out in the Empire of Iran case has been applied to the construction of this subsection as cited by Lord Wilberforce in Emperor uh, Premier Congress and in the section quoted which we've looked at. Secondly, the residuary category is not confined to contractual obligations. The express inclusion of activity into which a state engages enlarges its scope to include claims in tort in respect to which the state is a party, although it would not seem that such claims must comply with the commerciality test. Thirdly, and this is the key passage, the terms commercial transaction and activity otherwise than in the exercise of sovereign authority are positive and negative definitions of the same concept. A comprehensive dichotomy is thus set up by the state by which all acts not amounting to commercial transactions constitute acts in the exercise of sovereign authority. And that's what my learned friend, friend referred you to. But th this dichotomy between acts jure imperium and jure gestionis is elaborated by the addition of the descriptive words commercial, industrial, financial, professional, or other similar character <coughs> so as to embrace the widest conception of private law or commercial acts. Uh, and then fourthly, the language of section 3 to 8 is very broad uh, and deals with th that. Um, fifthly, the burden of proof appears to shift. The defendant having established itself as a state, the burden is upon the plaintiff to show that the transaction falls within one or, 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 or one of the three limbs of the definition of commercial transaction. But if the plaintiff establishes an activity of a commercial, industrial, financial, professional, or other similar character, it is arguably for the defendant to show that it entered or engaged in it in the exercise of sovereign authority so as to retain that immunity. Proposition 17, as is the position under customary international law, Proposition 7, it is the nature of the relevant act rather than the state's underlying motive or purpose for engaging uh, in the relevant activity that, that determines whether it is commercial within the extended meaning of the state immunity. And this is ground four uh, of uh, the... Um, but, but again, my learned friend, it's not common ground as regards, quote, property. Proposition 18, whether a cargo is in use or intended for use for commercial purposes within the extended meaning provided for in the State of Immunity Act is a question of fact, and appropriate inferences may be drawn in the usual way. Each case depends on its facts. Proposition 19, in order to answer the question whether a cargo is in use or intended for use for commercial purposes, it is necessary to determine the status of the cargo as either commercial or sovereign cargo. There is no third category. Uh, this is uh, ground five of the respondents' notice uh, and would appear to be common ground, subject to the fact that the Republic say state-owned property not in use or intended for use is sovereign. So they say there is a presumption that property uh, is sovereign. Uh, and it's in that sense that there is no third category. Uh, in, in this um, context, I was going to uh, refer to a passage I've already taken to you in the Altair bundle, uh, Authorities Bundle 13, page 301 to 302, to paragraph 82 uh, of the Altair, uh, which we submit as authority uh, for this proposition. And in addition, uh, I was going to refer you to the convention itself Authorities Bundle 3, divide, uh, divide 3, page 28. Article 25 of the Convention, which refers to 
non-commercial cargoes owned by a state. So this is the Brussels Convention? No, this is the Salvage Convention. Right. Sorry, Article 25 of the Salvage Convention. Authorities Bundle 3. Sorry, Authorities Bundle F Divide 3, page 28. where the distinction is drawn between commercial and non-commercial cargoes, and that distinction, we say, fundamentally undermines the mere ownership argument. Once one has to look at the maritime circumstances, it is the maritime circumstances in 1948 to which one must look to find the status of the cargo and the ship. And the distinction that we say may also inform the meaning to be given to the phrase in use uh, in the State of Unity Act. Well, no, I can't say that because the convention came later. Than the, sorry. At Proposition 20, uh, the uh, status of the cargo is prima facie dependent on whether the cargo was purchased pursuant to a commercial contract of sale and carried pursuant to a commercial contract of carriage. Uh, this also appears uh, to, sorry, this is not common ground. It's not. Uh, and in that regard, uh, I refer you again to a passage we've looked at the Altair Authorities Bundle 13, page 301, paragraph 82, Little Roman 1, where reference is made to bought and shipped, uh, giving the cargo its status uh, for the purposes of uh, section 10 uh, for uh, A. And I'll develop that proposition in a moment when I seek to apply the law to the facts. Uh, that, so th these are the propositions of law on which we build our case. Uh, it's probably sensible for me at this juncture to deal with the Trevate case uh, and, and just make, um, well, let's, let, let's, um, let's, let's, get, let, let's get it out. Additional authorities bundle two of one at divide eighteen. Uh, and um, first a submission. On any view, this case is not authority for the wide proposition suggested by Mr. Smith uh, on day three, page 87, lines 21 to 22, and I think again at 115, 13 to 14, where he said, where the property against which the Leon is owned, it, sorry, where the property against which the Leon is owed is state property. Um, the, the decision in this case was that because of immunity, uh, a maritime lien did not arise. Uh, not, not nearly as wide as my learned friend put it. The, the, the second point is the relevance of this case is therefore very limited it is only relevant if the Republic has won on immunity under the restrictive theory with the consequence that the receiver is prevented from detaining the cargo because our claim is based on Article 12 of the Salvage Convention and the Republic can rely on Article 25 of the Salvage Convention. And the relevant passages in my learned friend's Submissions were day, well, it's day, day two of this hearing, day four, page seven, lines three to eight, 
and page 14, line 21 to 15, line 11. And so, in the light of that, given its limited relevance, we say as follows. First, the Republic doesn't win on the restrictive theory, so the issue doesn't arise. Secondly, in any event, we argue that the Salvage Convention doesn't apply to the receiver because he is not a court within the narrow definition of, at Schedule 11, Part 2 of the Merchant Shipping Act. As regards the case itself, it was, of course, a collision case, not a salvage case, but that doesn't take me very far at all. The court was plainly influenced by the absolute theory of immunity, and for that reason, if it becomes of critical importance, we'd like to reserve the right to contend in the Supreme Court that the case was wrongly decided, despite the strength of the Court of Appeal. It does not address what happens, by way of example, if the state were to submit to the jurisdiction. Is there then a maritime lien that suddenly kicks in in those circumstances? But for present purposes, what I wanted to make good was the fact that Lord Justice Banks, at page 254 in the bundle, that's page 265 in the original, in the middle of the page, and Lord Justice Atkin on page 263 in the electronic copy, page 274, and I'll take this to Lord Justice Atkin, for present purposes, they both say similar things, really. The top of the page, 274, 263 in the electronic bundle. You've lost me. Are we looking at anything in Lord Justice Banks' judgment? I was going to take you just to one of them. I'm looking at the reference in Lord Justice Banks and taking you to Lord Justice Atkin. So, part of Lord Justice Banks that you'd like us to go and look at later is which? Page 265. 265 in the middle of the page. All right. We'll look at that in our own time. But you want us to go to Lord Justice Atkin where? Lord Justice Atkin, page 263, page 274 in the original, at the top of the page. True, such rights may be of little value as they cannot ordinarily be enforced by action. But the inability is a mere personal inability to sue. They can be made effective in defense, as for instance by set-off where the rights give rise to a power of set-off, and as I should suppose, by a plea of contributory negligence. And should the sovereign submit to the jurisdiction in respect of a claim based upon such rights, I apprehend that the court would be bound to give effect to them. So, what is being said is that the right subsists, although it doesn't give rise, if immunity is established, it doesn't give rise to a maritime lien. And even where the immunity is established, so far as the enforcement of the right is concerned, nevertheless, the right can be relied upon as an indefensible one. I 
propose to move on then to uh, the Human Rights Act. That, that's common ground, um, just by way of um, so that our case is clear. In relation to question one, uh, we say that Article 6 uh, is engaged. Uh, we say, in relation to uh, question 2.1, uh, that customary international law uh, doesn't offer a justification uh, for uh, the uh, outcome. Um, any interpretation of the State Immunity Act that goes further than the right to immunity for sovereign acts in customary international law is necessarily disproportionate. That's Lord Sumption in Pink Revolution, paragraph 34, and the Prestige, paragraph 40. Uh, if, in this case, if the Republic is immune from the jurisdiction of the English courts to award salvage, the State Immunity Act goes further than the immunity offered by customary international law and is therefore incompatible with Article 6. Uh, and in this case, there is no need to consider the margin of appreciation, uh, which was referred to in the, in, in the hot press, most recent case on this topic, certainly was the, of Sir Ross Cranston um, in the UK PNI Club, paragraphs 104, 3, and 105, which is in the additional authority of the bundle, provided 28, pages 602 to 603. <coughs> Question 2.2. Does domestic policy offer justification of this outcome? Uh, again, our answer is no. It would necessarily be for the Republic to identify a, quote, legitimate domestic policy pursued by proportionate means for the outcome. In Carbouche, paragraph 68, UK PNI Club, paragraph 117. We say they have not and cannot do so. Then question three, can section 10 to a be read down in a manner suggested by the solve uh, We say yes, uh, and uh, the uh, relevant principles uh, uh, derived uh, primarily from uh, the uh, House of Lords decision in uh, Gaidan, uh, and those uh, principles uh, are uh, set out, uh, and we say by way of conclusion, uh, that uh, the Sullivan's construction of Section 10 for a uh, is uh, well within these principles. Uh, there are multiple interpretive devices at the Court of Appeals' disposal. Uh, one would be to interpret the words in use for commercial purposes, uh, uh, like the Australian legislation, as effective when not in use for sovereign purposes reflecting not only the restrictive theory, but also the wider scheme of the phrase commercial purposes, section 17 and 3.3. Alternatively, interpret the words at the time the cause of action arose by reference to the status of the cargo at that time, together with the understanding uh, as set out by Lord Wilberforce in Prima Congresso. I think what would, what would probably help at all come up with an alternative um, I mean, if, you, if you're offering more than one alternative construction you need to find them out so we can look at them so you are, you ask, you ask, you're saying it's possible to read section 10 in a particular way yes well we need to know what that particular way is and uh, I think it would really help if you could formulate it and put it on a piece of paper so that you can I, I, see we, we'll do that over lunch I've yeah, just you. given First example. No, I know, but I think it would just help us, and it would probably help your opponents if we could actually see what your construction entails. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're not asking the court to rewrite the section, but to interpret discrete words within it in a manner consistent with the restrictive theory. Indeed, our primary case is that this exercise is not necessary and that precisely the same result will be produced through the ordinary principles of statutory construction. Uh, the Salvo's construction of Section 10 for a 
of the state and unity. Right? Uh, would, uh, using the language of uh, uh, um, Sir Ross Cranston, <coughs> would not go against the grain of the legislation, would not call for legislative deliberation or change the substance of the provision completely, would not remove its pith and substance, or would not viol violate one of its cardinal principles. Maybe well. not, but some of my others on the face of it, it would fly in the face of the language that's actually used in the section. And that's the real difficulty that we've got. You may well be right that uh, a literal interpretation of 10.4a um, is contrary to the restrictive theory. <laughs> the question really is how one gets, how one grasps that particular nettle and what, one, what if anything, is open to do about it. One answer to it may be, uh, as you say, um, concentrating on what's meant for, by use for commercial purposes. Yes. Uh, and the, the tools available to the court are those which we've set out uh, e e at paragraph 24.1 uh, uh, of the um, note that I've handed up, uh, which enables the court uh, to impose a stronger and more radical obligation than to adopt a purpose of interpretation. Um, even if construed according to the ordinary principles of interpretation, the meaning of the legislation admits of no doubt. Section 3 may nonetheless require the legislation to be given a different meaning. Section 3.1 applies even if there is no ambiguity in the language in the sense of it being capable of bearing two possible meanings. The word possible in Section 3.1 is used in a different and stronger sense. It may be necessary to depart from the intention of the Parliament which enacted the legislation. Uh, section 3 enables language to be interpreted restrictively or expansively. I'm not sure we need to read, read no. these out. We, okay, sorry. We need to read these out. Thank you. But you were, you, were, you were, in the course of giving us two examples, you say, of yes. a reading, whether it's with, with the benefit of these principles or not. One was uh, in use for commercial purposes means not in use for solar purposes. Correct. And the other was the words, at the time the cause of action arose, yes. I'm afraid I didn't then get what, what you said that meant. By reference to the status of the cargo, uh, at the time the cause of action arose, with the understanding that that status may be determined by past events. Determined or informed? I'm sorry? Determined or informed? Um, I mean, are you saying no, that no, you, 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 you effect, effectively ignore those words? No, no. Your, your uh, so, you're, so we're not concerned at all with what the position is when the cause of action arises? No, no. But your Lordship's correction is, is, is I accept entirely, it's informed. So, 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 so at the time the cause of action arises means at the time the cause of action arises. Well, does it mean at the time when each of the elements of the cause of action arises? It, it, it depends. No, I'm just want, I just want to understand what your submission is, uh, as, submission to, is as, to, as to what it means uh, either differently or by way of interpretation of, of those words at the time the cause of action arises. Uh, our case is at the time the cause of action, action arises when one looks at it in the context of the section as a whole, uh, it, it, that the judge's approach to it, it one is entitled, to, that, that is a route that one can go down. And he was, he came to the conclusion that he was doing no, um, he, he was complying with the, the terms of the statute in coming to that conclusion. If, however, you, your lordship and your ladyships come to a different conclusion, that the language doesn't permit it, uh, then w we say, in order to comply with the restrictive theory, then it must be read in the way that the judge read it at first instance. So that it's the status of the cargo uh, at the time the cause of action accrues, but that that status uh, is determined by, past, or is informed by past events, and if it has a particular status in 1942, and it can't be said that that status has changed by 2017, then that is its status in 2017. And we say that, that it, one is forced to
to come to that conclusion. Uh, otherwise, one has the absurd consequences of dealing with Rick. Can you just remind me which paragraph of the judge's judgment contains that conclusion? Paragraph 123, London, page 102, where he says, I therefore consider it appropriate to have regard to this. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I'm sorry, I, I am coming to uh, uh, all of this in due course. Um, well, there's another paragraph where he puts it a bit more strongly, I think, where he says that in most cases, the historic use will be the current. Now, can I then move on to the, um, the, the Act itself? And uh, it's, uh, that's uh, authorities under 1, tab 1. And, and can I say at the outset that I'm going to make submissions in relation to the meaning of particular words, and the temptation will be to ask a lot of questions about that. W what I would invite you in our submission, the exercise of construction is an iterative pro process, and all of these words and phrases need to be considered uh, alongside each other. Uh, and um, um, the submission which I'm making in relation to the meaning of the word ship, the meaning of the word cargo, in in use, in use for commercial purposes, they, they're all intertwined, uh, and um, I... I for that reason, I, 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 I'd like my, to make my submissions in... Uh, we'll, we'll do our best not to interrupt you until you're finished. <laughs> well, uh, it's very, I, very tactfully put. I, I'm, just, <laughs> I, I'm always open to questions, but I'm concerned that um, the bigger picture will help um, uh, understand precisely how we put it. Right. Okay. Um, so first moving to the meaning. This is 10, ten for a uh, on page 5. The meaning of the words ship and cargo. Uh, if one has regard to the first five proposition, my propositions of law, and in particular the fourth and fifth, salvage and the law of salvage apply to both ship and cargo, uh, even where the ship and cargo come within the definition of wreck, and, and no matter how long they have been wrecked, then with one notable textual exception, and I'll come to deal with that, Everything points to the words ship and cargo being given their ordinary meaning in the context of salvage, namely as including the wreck. The only contrary pointer, and it is a formidable pointer, I accept that, is the tense in which section 10.4a is cast, were at the time the cause of action arose in use. Both the ship and cargo must be in use at the time the cause of action arose. Uh, however, an interpretation based on the tense of the provision <coughs> faces two even more formidable obstacles uh, in our submission. First, on this interpretation, the section does not apply even to the facts of the vagina, as I explained them yesterday, the cap capsizing ship, where at the time the cause of action arose, uh, both the ship and cargo, although abandoned, uh, were in use. The tense interpretation suggests the wreck, non wreck distinction does not provide the solution. Uh, second and even more formidable, in the context of state immunity, the interpretation would create an immunity in a trice when the decisions were made to abandon permanently. This cannot have been intended uh, as it is clearly contrary to customary international law. So, so for these reasons, we submit that the words ship and cargo should not be interpreted as excluding wrecked ship and wrecked cargo. Then moving on to the words in use. If the words ship and cargo should be interpreted as including a wrecked ship 
a direct cargo, and accordingly a wrecked cargo which has been lying on the seabed for 70 years. And if the right to salvage arises only in the context of maritime circumstances, which we have established it does, when one comes to consider whether, when the cause of action arises, the ship and cargo are in use for commercial purposes, one must naturally have regard to the maritime circumstances and the status of the ship and cargo in the context of the maritime circumstances. The car wrecked cargo retains its status in use unless in the intervening period it has been put to a different use. This is because the salvage services are rendered in the context of the maritime circumstances to save the cargo. The Re Republic argue that if the status of the cargo in 1942 was relevant to the question of immunity, the cargo was not in use at all because it was merely on board the vessel, and I will deal with that argument fully in a moment. But for the moment, it's important to note that the learned judge acknowledged that as a matter of ordinary language, cargo may seem to be not in use when in the process of carriage on board a vessel. That's paragraph 96 of the judgment. Cargoes typically are not put to the use for which they were grown or manufactured during carriage. They're only put to the use for which they have been grown or manufactured after the carriage has been completed, and they're no longer on board the ship. The problem, however, with that interpretation is that it produces an absurd result, as the learned judge found, and is difficult to reconcile with the restrictive theory of state immunity, as the learned judge found. It produces an absurd result because, as the judge found at paragraph 154, if the phrase in use were to be understood in the sense suggested by the Republic, very few, if any, cargoes would be in use. As regards the cargo, the words in use would serve no practical purpose, and this despite the fact that the section requires both the ship and the cargo carrying it being in use or intended for use for commercial purposes. We say Parliament could not have intended such a result. Further, we say, where the cargo is intended for use for sovereign purposes, the interpretation effectively destroys the exception to immunity for in rem cargo claims. Again, Parliament could not have intended such a result. The provision would have been differently drafted if, at the time when the cause of action arose, the cargo was intended for use for commercial purposes and the ship was in use or intended use for commercial purposes. It wasn't. It was drafted that both the ship and the cargo carrying it are in use or intended for use for commercial purposes. I'm sorry to appear slow, and I'm also sorry to interrupt you, but I don't actually understand that last submission. You say that if intended for use is to be read, I suppose the cargo is not in use because it's being passively carried from A to B, and you look at what the owner intends to do with it, that somehow deprives the state of immunity or carves out the state immunity? It's probably my fault. I didn't quite follow the submission. No, it's my fault entirely. The point we're making is that if in use were interpreted in this way, then in use applied to the cargo would serve no practical purpose. Yes. Because the cargo is not in use. Yes. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
because it, it, it wouldn't... There's no point in having it there in relation to cargo. The, wor the word in use means nothing. And if you were simply looking at intended use, then really? that's what the draftsman could have said. Is that the point? That, that's the point. Right, got it. So thank you. The draftsman would have said the cargo was intended for use for commercial purposes and the ship was in use or intended for use for commercial purposes. All right. Thank you. Sorry. I took sorry, sorry, Mr. No, 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 absolutely. I'm just lagging behind. Then the interpretation is difficult to reconcile with the restrictive theory of state immunity uh, because, and here we simply refer to three paragraphs in the judgment, paragraph 155, paragraph 157, uh, and paragraph 150, uh, 161, uh, and uh, the judge's analysis which followed at, at paragraphs 162 to 165 in our submission, cannot be the same here. And the bottom line is that there is not a single sovereign act in the entire factual matrix, not one. How can immunity possibly attach in those circumstances, one asks rhetorically. But then coming on to the words commercial purposes, The starting point is uh, section 17.1 uh, uh, on page 10 of, of the Act, the interpretation section. It, it provides a definition of the phrase commercial purposes, means purposes of such transactions or activities as, as are mentioned in section 3.3. So one is looking to section 3.3 for the transactions and the activities. Uh, what then are the transactions and what are the activities mentioned in section 3.3? Uh, rather oddly, section 3.3 provides a definition for commercial transaction. However, a closer look at the sub-paragraph shows that they include within that definition transactions and activities, and it must be to these that the definition of section 17.1 is referring, because it refers to transactions and activities. And if one looks at section 3, uh, <coughs> the transactions uh, one sees uh, are, are at 3.3, uh, a contract for the supply of goods, Two, a contract for the supply of services. Three, any loan. Four, any other transaction for the provision of finance. Five, any guarantee or indemnity in respect of any such loan or other transaction for the provision of finance. <coughs> Six, any guarantee or indemnity in respect of any other financial obligation. And crucially, any other transaction into which the state enters otherwise than in the exercise of sovereign authority. Uh, one then looks to find where there is an activity. It seems there is only one activity identified in 3.3b. Any other activity in which the state engages otherwise than in the exercise of sovereign authority. So there are transactions into which the state enters and there are activities in which it engages. A and commercial purposes are the purposes of such transactions or such activities. So, so with this definition in mind, in, one can return to the relevant parts of section 10.4a, uh, replacing the phrase commercial purposes with its defined meaning, a state is not immune as respects an action in REM against a cargo belonging to the state if the cargo was in use, one example, for the purposes of any contract for the supply of goods. Or another example, if the cargo was in use for the purposes of any contract for the supply of services. Thirdly, if the cargo was in use for the purposes of any transaction into which the state enters otherwise 
and in the exercise of sovereign authority. Or, fourth alternative, if the cargo was in use for the purposes of any activity in which the state engages otherwise than in the exercise of sovereign authority. So, so that's the way in which one has to read section 10 or A uh, when one comes to look at the words commercial purposes. One needs to read in uh, the definition. Uh, I, I've moved on to the question of whether the cargo is in use for commercial purposes within the latter phrases defined meaning. <coughs> what the provision does not do is to offer an express answer to the question whose use. And, and that's been a matter that the court has asked questions about quite appropriately in our humble submission. The question whose use is relevant to both ship and cargo. Uh, taking the ship first, the ship does not belong to the state. It belongs to a third party. Is it the state's use which is relevant, i.e. the state's contract of carriage? Or is it the use to which the ship is being put in a general sense, merchant ship, that is relevant, i.e. operating as a commercial trading ship? The latter appears to have been accepted as correct by the Republic, use of the ship in a general sense. But is that correct? We submit it's not correct. And I'll advance that submission in a moment. Then moving to the cargo. The cargo <coughs> does belong to the state. But is it the state's use that is relevant? Or is it the use to which the cargo is being put in a general sense that is relevant? Here the Republic appears to have adopted an inconsistent approach. It contends for the former, the state's use. But is that right? Well, we submit that it is right. <coughs> we agree with them on that. Uh, one would expect, moving on, the use of the ship and the use of cargo to be viewed in the same way, either the state's use or use generally. Now, I, I appreciate that may be a contentious submission, uh, but uh, th that is uh, our submission. You'd expect them to be read in the same way. If it's the state's use that is relevant, the only relevant act to determine the use to which the state is putting the ship is a contract of carriage. A and if the analysis applies to the ship, so too it must apply to the cargo. If it is the state's use that is relevant, the only relevant acts to determine the use to which the state is putting the cargo are the international contract of sale and the international contract of carriage. This means that the international contract of carriage and the international contract of sale, which forms part of it, determines the use to which the cargo is put by the state. That, that, so that's if it's state's use. If it's general use, that is relevant, which may be thought in our submission to be unlikely, the relevant acts of Sorry, the ship... Are we on use of ship still, or on use of cargo? We're, we're still on use of ship. Thank you. Uh, if it's general use that is relevant, which we say is unlikely, the relevant acts are the general use to which the ship is being put, which is commercial and not sovereign. So I'm not sure, I, I thought I didn't understand what you mean by general use. U uh, use by whom? If a, if, a, if a third party was being asked to observe what was happening, and they looked at what, what, what so, was so happening... So use of the ship by anyone, as it were? Correct. Well, they would ask themselves, as a, as a bystander, what use is the ship being put to? being put to the use of trading. But is that really any different from the use by the ship owner? Mm. You, you, they may be the same, and, and generally they will be the same in the rest of a ship, but, but, but um, they, they, 
they may not as well, and that's why I'm drawing the distinction. But I, I'll think further as to whether there will ever be a distinction. But I think you disavow any suggestion that in, in cases of salvage, it can be use by the salvor. Have I understood? Yes, I'll come to that. Sorry. Not at all. And the general use to which the cargo is being put. Sorry, if it's the general use that is relevant, the relevant acts. Sorry, so far as the cargo. Now sorry to stop you. Are, are you. are you on general use of ship or general use of cargo? Now I'm moving to general use of cargo. I'm testing the first general use by relation to ship and then general use by relation to the cargo. If it's general use that is relevant, the relevant acts of the general use to which the cargo is being put, which is making it the subject of a commercial contract of international carriage by sea and sail, not sovereign use. Now, the question whose use is relevant uh, was answered in the context of a section 13.4 by Mr. Justice Mayles, as he then was, in LR Avionics Technologies and the Federal Republic of Nigeria, uh, which is in the authorities bundle, but I <coughs> deal with that in paragraph 37. But I wasn't going to ask you to, to go there uh, because uh, he, he just I will just tell you what he held uh, that the purposes must be those of the state against which property execution is sought. Now, we don't, do not suggest this case answers the question in the context of section 10.4a, but the judge's reasoning provides useful guidance because he had to do a similar unpacking of section 17.1 of the State Immunity Act by reference to section 3 of, of the Act. The end of all of that, our, our submission is that it's the use <clears throat> to which the ship and the cargo are being put by the state. A and in this context, it is critical to bear in mind that the relevant question is is the cargo, is the ship being used for purposes of a commercial transaction or activity? The relevant is, question is not how is the cargo or the ship being used? Is it being used for a commercial transaction or activity? Or for the purpose relating to such a transaction? <laughs> no, we will say it is being used for that purpose. So, and I'll come again to address this in a moment, explain why under international contracts for the carriage of goods by sea and international contracts for the sale of goods, the cargo is being used specifically for that purpose. Uh, and and I, I, as I say, I'll address that in a moment. It's not just relating to it, it's being used for that purpose. The, 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 the cargo can be the, the bills of lading, I'm jumping ahead of myself, let me come to it later. The bills of lading are negotiable documents that can be used you, as you security. You don't have to go that far because of the definition of commercial services in um, Section 17. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I failed to pick up your, my lady. All I'm saying is you don't have to go that far no. because of the definition in Section 17. I, I see that, and I'm so sorry for not, not understanding your. No, sorry, it's my fault for, not, for, for asking us, for, for putting a rather cryptic point here. Thank you. Uh, I, I was just drawing, I, I was pointing to the importance of asking the correct question. Uh, uh, on a basic level, the purpose of a contract of carriage is to carry the goods from A to B. The, the ship is clearly in use for the purpose. Uh, this is how it's being used. 
but that is to ask the wrong question. If the correct question is asked, the answer is that the ship is being used for the purposes of a commercial transaction or activity, namely the inextricably linked contracts of international sale and international carriage of goods by sea. It's not the purpose of the contract of carriage that is relevant, it is the nature of the activity that is relevant. <coughs> what is relevant is that the contract of carriage is, by its nature and character, a commercial transaction or activity, and that the cargo is in use for the purposes of such transaction or activity. S similarly, if you ask the wrong question about the cargo, how is it being used, the answer is, well, it's being carried. However, if you ask the correct question about the cargo, is the cargo being used for the purposes of a commercial transaction or activity, the answer is that the cargo is being used for the purposes of a commercial transaction or activity, namely the inextricably linked contracts of international sale and international carriage by sea. Cargo that's in the process of being transported pursuant to an international contract of sale and an inextricably linked international contract of carriage is in use for the purposes of a commercial transaction or activity, namely the inextricably linked contracts. But what is the specific activity of the state cargo owner which constitutes that use? The question is, is it being used for the purposes of that transaction? The answer is, yes, the cargo is being used. By, by, by the, you, you say use for cargo means used by the state cargo owner. Correct. What is the act, the, the, the act that is the cargo owner performs which constitutes activity for the purposes of those international contracts? Um, I, I'm only pausing because one of the difficulties created by um, Section 3.3 is that it is framed primarily in um, language of activity. Right. Well, what's and the activity? I was trying to... And, and, just, just have, but, and does not deal with uh, inactivity. Um, uh, in our submission, the, um, if one asks for what use is the cargo being put by the state, it's being put to the use for the purposes of the contract of sale and the contract of carriage. What, what's, what's the putting? But when you say put, the act, the what, what is the activity? The activity is specifically concluding the contracts, uh, which, w w which. Um, um, but the problem with that is that that doesn't result in the cargo, or isn't in any activity, which puts the cargo on the vessel. It does. It's entered into the contract of carriage uh, in order to um, transport the goods which it has purchased uh, to their destination. A a and Is your, is your case essentially that by entering into those two contracts, the state is engaging in activity which involves the cargo being put on board the vessel? Is, it, is that essentially the way of putting it? I think I can say yes to that. But I think that I would say that the, you've got to frame the question differently. Yes, but do you need to go as far as to show that there's some kind of activity going on? No. Because the question is the use and the purpose of the use. 
And so you, like. Use by the cargo owner. Well, the cargo owner, so you've got to ask yourself. If it's, if it's used by a particular person, you've got to ask yourself, what has that person done? Well, the cargo which constitutes is, use, don't you? Is the cargo being used for the purposes <coughs> of a contract of carriage? Used by so the cargo owner for those purposes. Yes, yes, because the cargo owner is putting the cargo to the, that use. Well, that's, that's what I'm asking you. That's, that's what I'm just... Right. I, I'm having Sorry. some difficulty in the idea that you don't have to focus on an activity of the state cargo owner, uh, that you simply start with some generic idea of what, what the use is. And, I, and I, I entirely understand your submission is what the cargo owner has done in this case by entering into the two contracts, and that is clearly activity, is done something which is essentially making arrangements for the cargo to be put on board the vessel. I would understand that, but you, you, you rather cavilled at that way of looking at it, you know? Well, I'm not I, sure I, why. I cavilled at it because I think that, with respect, your, your Lordship is still asking the wrong question, and, and um, but, but the result is the same, and so in a sense I don't mind, and I can move on. But, but the, 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 you say I shouldn't be asking what the use uh, is to which the cargo owner is putting the cargo, even though use is talking about use by the cargo owner. And <coughs> if that is your submission, I, I'm afraid I just don't quite understand it. No. It's my fault, I'm sure. Looking at the events, ask your, the question, is the cargo being used for purposes of a commercial transaction or activity? A and the answer to that is yes, and by the state. B because um, the, um, they're entering into the realm of trading, put it in a different way. A a and you, you don't have to look for some little act. What they're doing is they're well, trading. Right. Well, that's an act. That's an activity. Well, that's, okay. if that's, if, okay. but, the, but that is that is some activity on the part of the the, the state owner of the cargo. Uh -huh. What I'm having difficulty with is your know, various formulations, which seem resistant to the idea that one needs <laughs> to identify <coughs> something that the state cargo owner has done, and that you can uh, start with use in the abstract. I, I, I appreciate that's, that. That's the difficulty I'm having. I, I think that's that at the very... <coughs> the, the, the state has put themselves into this position, and that is an activity. Well, put the cargo into this position. Correct. I, you would say. I, I can entirely understand if that's the way you, you put Correct. it. Correct. Right. It's, it's entered, entered into the realm of trading. A, and this conclusion was, was the one the judge came to uh, at paragraph 163 of the judgment as regards the position in 1942 and with respect he was right just quickly I'm persuaded that it is right to conclude notwithstanding the cogency of the argument of the contrary that when a cargo is sold under an FOB contract and shipped on board pursuant to a contract of carriage contained in or evidenced by a bill of lading it is used for commercial purposes that is the ordinary and natural meaning of the phrase in use or intended for use for commercial purposes when regard is had to the context of cargoes on board a ship and also to the restrictive theory of state immunity, which is the background against which the State Immunity Act is to be interpreted. So, so the ship and the cargo together are being used for trading. <coughs> I, I, that, I can very happily accept that's the activity to facilitate international trade. The, commercial, the ship is a commercial ship, and the cargo is a commercial cargo, using the language of, of the salvage Commission. It's common ground that the ship was in use for commercial purposes in 1942. As regards the cargo, whatever intention the Republic might have had as to the use to which to put the silver following the international carriage to Durban, that intention could have changed again in a trice. It is well within the power of the Republic en route to negotiate the bills of lading and to on-sell the cargo. Uh, this is one of the great benefits of international sale uh, 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 of goods contracts, which involve 
negotiable bills of lading, as the bill of lading was in this case, um, and paragraph 27 of the judgment, the sophisticated system is designed to facilitate trading. And the same analysis would have pertained even if the bill of lading was not negotiable. The cargo would still have been in use for the purposes of a commercial transaction or activity. Well, Mr. Hoffman, I don't really understand why we're going here because use or intended use are, are not conjunctive, they're disjunctive. Uh, if it's not in use for commercial purposes, you then look to find out what its intended use is. Uh, if you if it is in use for a commercial purpose, then you don't need to bother about what the intention is for its use. Uh, if, if it's if there's an active being performed commercial contract or there's engagement in trading in the wider circumstance, I'd, it really doesn't matter a, a hoot whether you've got a bill of lading or not. No, no that is that is correct. I'm um, absolutely correct. From an international trade perspective. The analysis all makes sense. The words transaction and activity, and in a sense I'm coming now to answer my, my Lord's question, which I did so inelegantly a moment ago. The, the section 33C activity in which the state engages is trade, the purchase of cargo and the international carriage of that cargo by sea. The section 33C transactions into which the state enters are international contracts for the supply of goods and an international contract for the supply of services. Both of the most regularly encountered contracts for the international supply of goods, an FOB and a CIF contract, involve obligations relating to the shipment, the carriage, and the delivery of the goods. It's important that these rights and obligations are properly understood. The seller is obliged to ship the goods. The seller is generally obliged to procure, amongst other documents, a bill of lading. One of the functions of the Bill of Lading is to contain or evidence the terms of the contract of carriage with the ship. Having procured the proper shipping documents, including the Bill of Lading, the seller is generally obliged to tender the documents to the buyer. The seller is also obliged physically to deliver the goods to the buyer. Under an FOB contract, this generally takes place upon shipment. Under a CIF contract, this is generally symbolic taking place upon the tender of documents. The buyer is obliged to pay the price. Where this is not already fixed, the buyer is obliged to specify the destination, timelessly. Each of the parties to the contract has rights and obligations, but it also has remedies during the voyage. For example, the buyer may, in appropriate circumstances, reject the goods or claim damages for non or defective delivery of either goods or the documents. The unpaid seller may have rights of lien and stoppage in transit. Contracts for the international sale of goods are sophisticated and have many aspects. They are first and foremost contracts for the sale and purchase of trading documents, documents which include documents of title to the goods. The documents and the cargo which they represent are being traded. They also give rise to contracts for the carriage of goods by sea. So, so when you come to section 10.4a and ask, was the cargo in use for commercial purposes, we submit that it's a simple step to conclude that the cargo was in use for commercial purposes. In December 1942, the cargo was being used for the purposes of facilitating trade, Cargo was an essential ingredient in making the trade possible. To use Mr. Smith's words on day one of this adjourned appeal, uh, sorry, oh, no, day one of the original appeal, page 19, lines 17 to 18, it is required to make the transaction work. The activity in which the RSA has engaged was international trade. The transactions into which the Republic has had entered were international trading contracts. Giving the words their ordinary and natural meaning, the cargo is in use for commercial purposes. The negotiable bills of lading, which represented the goods, continued to evidence a contract between the Republic and the ship owner with ongoing rights and obligations. Uh, international trade uh, is an activity in which the state engages 
otherwise than in the exercise of sovereign authority. Indeed, the fact that the state engages in international trade <coughs> and must be held accountable for the consequences is the reason, raison d'etre for the shift to restrictive immunity. In the present case, both the ship and cargo were in use for these purposes. Um, my, my learned friend <coughs> made a concession uh, in uh, his skeleton argument in relation to a cargo being sold by a state on CIF terms. Um, uh, he was right in making that concession, but in our submission, uh, he should be uh, making a, a much more fundamental concession uh, in relation to the use of, of the cargo uh, in 1942. Uh, won't go into there now. So in our submission, this uh, analysis gives the word use its ordinary and natural meaning. The cargo is being used for trading. <coughs> this does not involve giving the word a strained meaning. Now, it's in this context uh, that I should deal with the the scenario postulated uh, yesterday by my Lord Lord Justice Popwell, um, having regard to section 10.4b, a, a scenario post postulated yesterday was a Brussels Convention states cargo intended for purely sovereign purposes being carried on a merchant vessel. Uh, in cases other than salvage, there would be no immunity. The fact that it was intended for sovereign purposes would be entirely irrelevant. A as regards contractual salvage in this scenario, Section 10.4 has to do all the work because Section 10.6 removes all the other exceptions to immunity. That's the uh, situation one's in. As a consequence, in deciding Section 10.4, what it means, contractual claims for salvage cannot be put aside. Now, in that context, uh, Mr. Smith agreed that uh, in the scenario postulated, Section 10.4 does have to do all the lifting, but he added a proviso with the assistance of the Convention, uh, and it was put to him that on his construction there would be a claim for contractual, there would be, there would not be a claim for contractual salvage under 10.4b in the case of a wreck because the vessel would not be in use. And he had no answer to that suggestion. He accepted that there would be a valid claim for salvage, but a claim against which the state uh, would be immune. The construction for which we contend does not lead to this perverse conclusion. Uh, on these facts, when the cause of action arose, the ship carrying the cargo was in use I hope that provides our um, uh, response uh, to that scenario. Draw, drawing the threads together, uh, it's common ground that the, in 1942 the Talawa was in use for commercial purposes. Uh, for the reasons I have given, it is our submission that the silver was also uh, in use for commercial purposes uh, in 1942. Uh, given the status of the cargo and the ship carrying it on the voyage from India to South Africa, each was in use for commercial purposes. And if the ship had run aground or lost power on the journey and the ship and cargo had been solved, any challenge by the Republic to a claim by salvables for salvage on the grounds of state immunity would have failed. Similarly, if the ship had sunk in shallow water following abandonment by her crew and had been refloated soon afterwards by a salvage team acting speculatively, the Republic of South Africa would have not enjoyed sovereign immunity, but instead would have been liable for salvage. The Republic would not, uh, would not have been immune because both the cargo and the ship carrying the cargo would have been, at the time the cause of action arose, in use for commercial purposes. What do you say to the point that Mr. Smith makes, which is that let's assume you're right about the trading, so that at the time of the venture there is 
was um, a use for commercial purposes, both for the ship and the cargo. But the, the, the tr on any view, once the ship has sunk, whether it sinks immediately, and you can immediately go down and get it up, or, or whether it takes 67 years plus for um, technology to move that far, um, that venture, that commercial, commercial venture, can no longer be performed once you abandon the ship. Uh, and therefore, it, it's artificial to say that the ship and the cargo are still being used for commercial purposes uh, when they can't be used for anything. Uh, and indeed, um, it, maybe your answer is, well, um, looking at the background, um, they're not being used for a sovereign purpose, uh, and therefore it doesn't matter. But um, I get that point. But uh, what do you say to the frustration of the commercial venture point? Well, he, precisely the point that my lady has just made. Uh, but, but in addition, um, um, the absurd consequences changing from the moment that the ship becomes wrecked um, and the cargo becomes wrecked with no justification whatsoever for the state to have immunity in those circumstances restrictive theory is absolutely no principled basis upon which the position should change in a trice. And yes, I'm reminded again um, um, Lord Denning's the Master of the Rolls, once a trader, always a trader. In that context, the status, which is Mr Justice Gross's point, and the old said it's the status that you're status doesn't change. Uh, and in the context of salvage, the status of the cargo doesn't change. Well, that, 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 ex that expression, once a trader, always a trader, was disapproved. No, it was qualified. In the Congresso. It was qualified. Qualified. Uh, uh, and the qualification you, doesn't... You, you, you wouldn't say that once, once a vessel in commercial use, if I can use that shorthand, always a vessel But, 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 but yeah, yeah, I'm being reminded from both sides of my view. There has to be a positive act thereafter to change the status. And that I understand. If, if in um, 2000. Um, and, and, and your case is abandonment can't do that. Correct, otherwise you run into the absurd consequences. If it's abandonment of, if it's abandonment, I, of I property, mean abandonment in the in the wreck sense. If, if, if it's abandoned in the wreck sense, you run into all the problems with wreck. That's why I showed the the issues in this case. The the the, 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 the primary case, the whole of it, is based upon that wreck non wreck distinction, A, and we say that leads to completely and utterly absurd consequences, which nobody could possibly in their right mind have intended. Well, it also means that even if the, there was never, if, if it was a purely commercial transaction, what we're talking about is not silver bullion, which is ultimately going to be smelted for the um, treasury, uh, but it's a cargo of um, something else that was actually intended for a commercial on sale, um, so that the, the state was in fact engaged in trading in any, any sense of the uh, and it goes to the bottom of the ocean, um, then notwithstanding the restrictive theory, nobody can actually claim salvage in relation to it. C correct. That's and, uh, yeah. I, um, the, the consequence I is not just... Uh, it, that your, your, your ladyship's point is, is, is correct. The consequence is not just that... Uh, um, state-owned cargo, which was arguably not in use uh, for commercial purposes, you, you lose the salvage, but you lose it for all purposes. You yeah. lose it whatever, whether it's a commercial ship and a commercial cargo which is intended for use for commercial purposes, you, the state's immune, the moment of abandonment. Yeah. I understand what we said about the consequences, but uh, you, you've <laughs> identified the relevant activity of the state in relation to use of the cargo in 1942 as the entering into of the international contracts which resulted in being put on board the vessel and becoming cargo. Um, so the 
commercial purposes, used as a shorthand for what we get in Section 3, uh, are those contracts. Now, what are the commercial purposes in 2017? We say that what, once the status, we're back to the rec, non rec. Oh, don't, 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 sorry. Um, I, I know status is a word that is used in the authorities, but to my mind, it rather obscures rather than clarifies uh, what we're looking at. We're looking at the position when the cause of action arises, yes. and we're looking at whether at that stage the cargo was in use by the state cargo in, in, in this case for commercial purposes what, what were those commercial purposes in 2017 they, they can't be the same commercial purposes can they yes. as existed in 1942 yes because for the purposes of salvage uh, you, you are looking at the maritime circumstances and what tells you what the maritime circumstances are is um, the, the use to which the ship and cargo were being put in 1942. Test it this way. If in 19, January 1943 um, um, somebody had come along and invented a ROV that could go down and they pulled up the cargo at the, that stage, um, the, the position is no different to what it is in this case. The fact that it's lay on, laying on the seabed for 70 plus years. Wait, the problem, doesn't the problem all stem from the use of the phrase and used at the time the cause of action arises in Article 3.1 of the Brussels Convention? And then Article 3.2, which says the same rules shall apply to state owned cargo, which may well import the cause of action point as well. And then the draftsman's attempt to reflect that in Section 10. Can I just make uh, I've noticed the time? Yeah. Um, uh, in our submission, abandonment does not indicate a change of use from non sovereign to sovereign. It doesn't ch indicate a change of use at all. Um, it, all. All it may do is change an intended use. going to um, move on, but I noticed the time. Would that be a convenient moment, or would you like me to... Um... No, we'll break there at 2 o'clock. Thank you, sir.